On more than one occasion, I have presented the good news of forgiveness of sins through faith in the finished work of Christ, only to have someone say to me, but why are there so many hypocrites in the church? You ever had anybody bring that up to you? I'd, like, I'd be interested. You ever heard anybody object to Christianity because of the hypocrites? Well, I've, that's a very common objection to Christianity. Uh, then they tell me all kinds of stories, like, you know, there was uh, some Christian who cheated them out of money, or the, remember years ago, one fellow complaining because a pastor he knew ran off with the organist, or the treasurer ran off with money. They come up with all these kinds of stories. Now, in this series, I've been dealing with the objections to Christianity, and some of them are intellectual, like, how do you know there's a God? Uh, how do you know the Bible is reliable? Some of those kinds of questions are intellectual questions. This one is intellectual to a degree, but this one can get emotional real quick. Mm -hmm. That there are people who have been wounded by Christians they consider them hypocrites and then they wipe out all Christianity. So it's not just an intellectual problem for them, it is an emotional reaction to inconsistent Christians. That makes this a little more tricky to deal with. I think that in some of those cases you need to discern, is this just an intellectual question or have they been burned by a Christian? And you might have to deal with this a little differently at that emotional level. Now what I'm going to do is answer the intellectual side of this question. But I just want to say up front, there could be emotional dimensions to this that you need to be aware of and address that. But some of addressing that is addressing just an understanding of hypocrisy. As a matter of fact, I don't think most people understand what a hypocrite is. I don't think I did for a long time. It's one of those words that Christians use uh, that we never define. And it just sort of hangs out there. There are several of those that go around, including the word love in most places. But I think what I want to do is really examine and probe exactly what is a hypocrite. So uh, this has some ramifications beyond just the objection to Christianity. Some of this applies to us. When are you a hypocrite? Is it possible for a Christian to be a hypocrite? All those kinds of things. And what does that mean? Uh, so all of those questions I think we need to look at. So here's what I propose to do. What I'd like to do is begin by just uh, describing hypocrisy. Let me call that the Christian explanation or the Christian position of hypocrisy. What is it? <clears throat> then, after I lay out the biblical data, I'd like to back off and look at what goes on today, the current situation, I will call it. And to conclude, I'd like to put it all in some kind of a correct perspective. Now, if, you if I lose you somewhere along the line, what's most important is that conclusion that I'm going to give, that what I'm going to call correct perspective. I'm going to try to lay it out as simply and clearly as I possibly can. All right, let's start with what I'm going to call the Christian position explaining hypocrisy. What would the Bible say hypocrisy is? Well, I want to start with the word hypocrite. That word is a very fascinating word study. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that words change meaning over time. Mm -hmm. That words have multiple meanings sometimes. My, one of my very favorite illustrations is that in 1611, the Bible was translated into English. That wasn't the first time, but that's the one that got all of the attention. In the King James Version of 1611, Romans 1 says that Paul told the Romans, many times I wanted to come to Rome, 
but I was let hitherto. What does that mean? Well, in 1611, L-E-T meant hindered. What the Greek text says, and all modern translations, including the New King James says, is many times I wanted to come to Rome, but I was hindered. But the word L-E-T, let, has completely reversed its meaning in the years since 1611. Fascinating. Now, that's just an illustration. The word hypocrisy hasn't done exactly that, but something similar. So let me give you a quick summary of the evolution of the word hypocrisy. For example, it be, originally it meant simply to answer, to reply. That's all it meant. Then it came to mean to answer on a stage or to play a part. Now, there's nothing negative at this point. Matter of fact, this word simply means at that point that you are an actor. That's all it means. There is an ancient author, orator, who was favorably called an exceptionally and many talented hypocrite. But what that meant was you were a exceptional and many talented actor. That's all it meant. So at that stage of development, the word hypocrite was favorable. It was good. But the meaning degenerated to come up with a bad sense. And in that sense, it meant to play a part off stage. Now, every, when you're on stage, everybody knows you're acting. When you're acting off stage, they don't know whether you're acting or not, and this takes on the flavor of a negative meaning. So then, it means to put on an act. To prepare, to prepare, or pretend I should say, to be something or someone that you are not. And that's the core meaning of hypocrite. You are pretending to be something, but you are really not that person. Now that's sort of the meaning I have for hypocrite for many years. That uh, it's simply pretending pretending to be something that you're not. But then when you're pretending to be something you're not, you often uh, say you commit a sin. Fill in the blank. Well, is it possible to commit that sin and not be a hypocrite? Is every time you sin you're a hypocrite? Then what's the difference? And that's what I don't think I understood most of my Christian life until uh, I delved into this. As a matter of fact, one of the first things that got me started, there's a radio talk show host named Dennis Prager. He is a uh, Jewish fella, and most of what he has to say is about political issues, but he very much knows the Hebrew scriptures. And I heard him one day talk about being a hypocrite. And he made a distinction that I don't think I'd ever heard up until I heard him say it. And what he said was this. Some people commit wrong because they are weak. Hmm. They want to do what is right, but they are weak, too weak to do it. Hypocrites are pretending to do right, but they really intend to do wrong. Now that is a fascinating little distinction to me, and I think accurate. Let me give a simple illustration. David committed adultery. Was he a hypocrite? Well, I think most people would write him off as a hypocrite. But David had, David had a heart after the Lord. 
I think the Apostle Paul, I'll get to this later, in Romans 7 describes the struggle that went on with some, within him and other Christians. So I think that there are people who have a heart for the Lord and they succumb to temptation and they sin. That's not exactly hypocrisy. Hypocrisy in the Bible is knowing that you are doing wrong. And you do that, but you cover it up with an act. But the heart at that point is to do wrong. That is technically hypocrisy. Now, um, the question becomes, uh, can you be, who, who are these people? Are these Christians or are they non-Christians? Well, I, we need to examine that. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. This is the longest passage in the Bible on hypocrisy. And it's spoken by Jesus himself. As I read this passage, see if you can figure out if, in his opinion, these people are believers or unbelievers. Matthew chapter 23, and I'm going to start reading at verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widow, widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive the greater condemnation." Woe to you, scribes, hypocrites, or Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as such, much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obligated to perform it. Fool and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sacrifices the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, is it nothing but whoever swears by the gift that's on it, he is obligated to perform it? Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sacrifices the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwell in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and cucumber and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside are full of exhortation and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish, that the outside then may be cleaned also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like the whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully outward, but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also uh, outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside are full of hypocrisies and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you have built the tomb of prophets and adorned the mountains, the monuments of the righteous. And say, if we had lived in the day of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore you are witnesses against yourself, that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilts. Serpents, blood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of 
hell. Whoa. Whoa. Can you imagine somebody preaching like that today? How about having that in a private conversation? Not just a sermon, but just in a crowd of people and you start out like that. That's heavy stuff. Now, we don't have time to go through all this passage, but I just want to point out a couple of things. <clears throat> Jesus was against hypocrisy. <laughs> Is that an understatement? <laughs> you get the point? Uh, the other thing I would point out, that in this case, there is no question but that they didn't know the Lord. They were unsaved. As a matter of fact, that becomes very clear in verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves... That's pretty clear. They don't go into the kingdom. Uh, look at verse 33. Serpents, blood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? So he begins and ends this passage by clearly saying, You are not saved. The other thing I would point out in this passage is that it's very obvious that these hypocrites are pretending to be something they are not. So look at verse 14. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you receive the greater condemnation. The word I'm interested in in that verse is pretend. And what they do, according to verse, what is it, 23, you neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. So, there's no question, but that in his mind, they are pretending outwardly, but don't have anything inwardly. Verse 28 says, even so you also appear righteous to men, but inside are full of of hypocrisy and lawlessness. What fills you up inside is lawlessness. Mm. Pretending on the outside to be something that you're not on the inside. Mm. Now I think this really spells out Jesus is opposed to hypocrisy and makes the obvious a little observation that it's the difference between what you are inside and what you are outside. So their goodness was merely external, not internal. Their goodness was designed to impress men, not please God. Their attitude is to me be the credit, not to God be the glory. Theirs was a theatrical goodness. Actually, their problem was more serious than just a wrong motive. They hid their motive and an evil heart behind, behind a cloak of pretended piety. Mm. That's the idea behind lawlessness on the inside. I think it, you could say from this passage that hypocrites deceive themselves as well as other people. Verse 15 says, you know, you, you make no end to trying to win a proselyte. And when you've won him, well, he's twice the child of hell that he would have been otherwise. That seems to indicate that they operate under deception. They are deceived and they deceive other people. Now, my point is, hypocrites in this passage are unsaved. The question is, could a genuine Christian be a hypocrite? This gets interesting. Real interesting. Turn to 2 Peter. I'm, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. The last verse in chapter 1 says, Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. 
Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. Now, let me ask you a question. Are these verses talking to Christians or non-Christians? Christians. Any doubt about that? No. Do you ever tell a non-Christian to grow in grace? No. no. Well, he says grow. By desiring the milk of the word. And he ends the second epistle by saying grow in grace. Well look at verse 1. You babes in Christ. Lay aside all malice. That's an attitude of getting even. Deceit. And hypocrisy. Hmm. Envy. Evil speaking. Could a Christian be envious? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. <laughs> could, could Christians speak evil? Yes. Yeah. Could a Christian have an attitude of want to get even? Mm -hmm. Yep. Who hasn't done that? Could a Christian uh, deceive somebody? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. The point I want to make is that in... Matthew chapter 23, hypocrisy is clearly uh, the case of unsaved people. But a Christian can do the same thing. Now, that bothers some people. Uh, some preachers even. So let me, uh, well, let me give you an illustration. And then let me give you an explanation. Uh, turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. The hypocrite in the Bible is going to surprise you. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 13. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Now, who's him? Peter. Peter. Wow. The fellow who said, put away hypocrisy. <laughs> Later he said it. This was written many years before that. All right. Uh, let me see if I can explain this without looking at the passage. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says that believers should not walk, and that's a word in Ephesians for live, don't live like the Gentiles, meaning an unsaved person. They should not live. And then he goes on to say that what you need to do, and he lists some of the characteristics of an unsaved person, the way they think, the way they feel, the way they act. And he says, put all that off. So that passage is teaching that a Christian can commit any sin an unsaved person can commit. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure. Then he says what you need is to renew your mind. So that you then put on other things. Godly virtues, righteousness, and truth are the two he mentions. So that in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 17 and going on for several verses, Paul is teaching, don't act like you did before you became a Christian. And the way you don't do that is you change the way you're thinking. You learn Christ. You become like Christ. And that means you put off, you do away with the way you used to think. You do away with the way you used to feel. You do away with the way you used to act. And you then start acting in truth and righteousness. Okay? So my conclusion is simply this. Unfortunately, Christians can pretend to be something that they are not. Now, the first thing I wanted to do was just explain what the scripture says about hypocrisy. And the answer is, Christians and non-Christians can pretend to be something that they are not. 
Now, that doesn't mean every time you sin, you're being a hypocrite. Some people sin because they just are weak. They know better and they struggle with it and they sin. Hypocrites intend to do something wrong and cover it up by the way they are acting. It's a little different. All right, the second thing I said I wanted to discuss is, okay, that's the biblical information. What is the current situation? What's the current problem? Well, the, the current problem is that people use this issue as a stone to throw at Christianity. It's one of the objections. Sometimes they will use things like, and I've had this brought up to me, they will bring up things like the Crusades, or the Spanish Inquisition, or the Salem Witch Trials. And they will use all of that to say, look what was done in the name of religion. And let me tell you, a lot of evil has been done in the name of religion. Pascal wrote, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. And that's true. Matter of fact, uh, Christians who think they're right have done all kinds of things to run over other people. And so, unfortunately, that's true. Or they'll bring it into the present. And they usually come up with things like, well, uh, that Christian cheated me out of money. It was financial exportation, or adultery, or lying. Uh, now, frankly, some of those people might not be saved. They might be church members, but that doesn't mean they know the Lord. You know, I'd like to know if they were going to a gospel preaching church in the first place. So some of them could be uh, unbelievers. There's a difference between Christianity and churchanity. Mm -hmm. You can be a churchgoer and church attender without knowing Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins by trusting in Him and Him alone, I might add. So let me, let me massage that a little bit. Why do people go to church? There's all kinds of reasons why people go to church. All churches. Some of them go to church because they grew up in it. They were trained to go to church. Their family went. Matter of fact, I talked to a fellow this week, and uh, it was a short conversation. And where he went to church came up, and what he told me is, my family goes there. And he rattled them all off. And I thought, getting him to visit our church would be very difficult because of the family ties. That doesn't mean he knows the Lord. It means he goes to church. That's all it means. I think there are some people who go to church for business reasons. I've had them tell me that. I think I've had one or two stick their nose in the door. They didn't last very long, by the way. This isn't a place to do commercials unless I give it <laughs> for spiritual reasons. Yes. All right, um, I just think that people put on the externals of religion and they don't have the reality of Christ. Mm -hmm. So let me illustrate. Church attendance does not make you a Christian. No more than going to a baseball game makes you a baseball fan. I mean, just imagine. I assume that most people are willing to pay the price to go to a Dodger game are baseball fans. But that doesn't mean everybody in those stadiums are baseball fans. Maybe somebody gave them the ticket. Maybe there's this fella who's dating this girl and he want, he's the baseball fan and he wants her to go and she goes not because she's interested in the Dodgers, but because she's interested in him. So you look at the attendance at the ball game and say, wow, look at all these Dodger fans. Not so fast. Mm -hmm. And likewise, you can look at people in church and think they're all Christians, but not so fast. Now, I'm talking about the current reality. The current reality is 
There are unsaved people who appear to be Christians, but they aren't, they aren't believers to begin with. But I must add, unfortunately, Christians can play the part of a hypocrite. I think that there are Christians who know the Lord and there's a level and a sense in which they love the Lord but they've got all kinds of other things going on in their heart and life that really prevents them from growing. I think there are people that go to church because they want to impress other people. They might want to impress their mate or their potential mate or they want to be the center of attention. I think I've seen people that just want to be the center of attention. Church gives them that. So they go to church. Or they yearn for acceptance. Or they have a fear of rejection or a feeling of insecurity. And so they put on this facade of spirituality. But there is no real burning heart for the Lord. They know the Lord. But they're not full of the Lord. They're full of themselves. It's easy sometimes to pick these out if you're plugged in. Just listen to them talk. Uh, my wife's sister, Glenda, has a little proverb. People tell you who they are. Just listen. Just listen. If you're perceptive enough, they'll tell you exactly who they are. So listen to Christians. All right. Let me say this another way. This will come as a shock to some of you. Christians are not perfect. <laughs> Glad you saw that entertaining. What we are are perfectly forgiven. Amen. That's what we are. We're not claiming to be perfect. We're only claiming to know the perfect one. The issue is not perfection anyway, it's progression toward perfection, which in the Bible means maturity. So, unfortunately some Christians just don't grow very much. As I've, you've probably heard me say before and you'll probably hear me say again, I had a pastor tell me years ago, people grow but not much. And I would add to that, People grow not much, and when they do, they grow slowly. And if you want to see an illustration of that, just go home and look at the potted plant, or the dog, or the cat, or the kid. Life grows slowly. Now, there are some dramatic stories of people who changed on a dime. I've heard them, and so have you. Those are the exceptions. Growth is usually slow. So, we're not perfect. We still have the capacity to sin and we need to grow. Do I need to review Romans 7 to you? Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, those are the things I do. That's a Christian experience. Now, there's deliverance in that passage. The problem is believers don't take it. All right. <clears throat> Let me conclude by talking about a proper perspective on all of this. Now, this is what I want you to remember. Three very simple things. Number one, Jesus is perfect. Amen. Okay? What <clears throat> is my opinion, Christianity stands or falls on Jesus Christ. Amen. If he's a hypocrite, it all falls. If he's perfect, it stands. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. One of the best descriptions of this I ever heard came from a book entitled, I'm Glad You Ask, mm -hmm. by Boa and Moody. They said, and I quote, Jesus spoke the, most no the noblest words ever spoken, and the standards he raised were so high that they were humanly unattainable. But, in the life of Jesus, his words and work were seamlessly a piece. His perceptions were perfectly matched by his practice. He spoke of loving one another and displayed unmatchless compassion for people on every level. He spoke of servanthood and became the model of the servant. 
He spoke of obedience to the will of his Father and walked every moment in complete dependence and submission to the life and will of God. He was the humblest and wisest man who ever lived, and his character was perfectly realized by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He spoke the truth and lived the truth. And when publicly asked, which one of you convinces me of sin, no one was able to respond. His own disciples who lived with him day and night were more than three year, for more than three years declared him sinless in 1 Peter 2.22 and 1 John 3.5. Jesus was against hypocrisy and his life was the antithesis of hypocrisy. Our job is to help those who raise the question of hypocrisy to see that they actually agree with us and with Jesus on the issue. We need to tell them Christ strongly denounced hypocrisy and was the opposite of hypocrisy in his own life and character. So when somebody objects to Christianity what do, uh, by saying it's they're full of hypocrites, what do we say? We're opposed to hypocrisy too. We agree with you. Mm -hmm. Jesus agreed with you. Read them, Matthew 23. Mm -hmm. First point, Jesus is perfect and is against hypocrisy. Second point, Christians are not perfect. Christianity does not claim that Christians are perfect. Only that we know the perfect one who has perfectly forgiven us. In fact, unlike folklore, fantasy, and storytelling, the Bible does not hide the inconsistencies and imperfections of people who followed the Lord. Mm -hmm. Noah got drunk. Moses got so angry in diso direct disobedience to the Lord, he wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. David committed adultery, and Peter denied the Lord. The Bible doesn't hide that Christians sin, or even that sometimes they play the part of a hypocrite. But here's the point. If you've missed everything I've said and this issue ever comes up, this is the one thing I think you need to remember. Hypocrisy does not disprove Christianity. Amen. Christ is perfect. Christians are not. But here's the third thing, and this is what you must remember. Hypocrisy does not disprove Christianity. Mm -hmm. The presence of, Christian, of hypocrisy does not disprove the claims of Christianity, namely that Christ is perfect, that he died for our sins, that he arose from the dead, that we are sinners, and that we get forgiven by trusting him as our Savior. Amen. That's what Christianity is claiming. Now if you want to disprove Christianity, challenge the core. But let me go one step further. Hypocrisy doesn't disprove Christianity. No more than quacks disprove the medical profession. Or counterfeit money disproves that there's real money. Or that a forgery in art proves that there's the real thing. Actually, the, the hypocrisy proves that Christianity is true. Did you hear that? Did you hear what I just said? Hypocrisy proves that Christianity is true. The presence of hypocrites indicates that Christianity is genuine and valuable. People don't counterfeit paper sacks. <laughs> they counterfeit $20 bills. So the fact that you've got a hypocrite means that this is worth copying. Even though that's the phony part. So this isn't a disproving of Christianity. It's the exact opposite. The very presence of a bogus bill proves that there's legitimate money somewhere. So hypocrites are in the church because depraved people want to appear righteous. But that does not prove that Christianity is not true. 
Let me say one more thing. Underlying the discussion of hypocrisy is the insinuation that the presence of hypocrite indicates that Christianity does not work and therefore is not true. Well, obviously, Christianity does not work for hypocrites. But that doesn't mean it doesn't work for hundreds and thousands and millions of other people. The fact is, Christ has changed millions. Christianity does work for millions of people. So the presence of hypocrites does not should not prevent you from becoming a Christian. Any more than a quack should prevent you from going to see a legitimate doctor. Or a counterfeit money should prevent you from accepting and giving paper money that's real. Or reproductions do not hinder people from seeking and securing legitimate art. One more. If this is your objection, and you need to think about this. If you're so opposed to hypocrites, the first thing you need to do is get saved and real quick. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, you're going to go where they're going to end up. Yeah. So, if you don't want to be with them and spend eternity with them, if you dislike them so much, then I suggest you trust Jesus Christ. Amen. Father,